Good morning, everyone. And let's begin the last morning of this wonderful event with the talk of Pierre van Hove, uh, closed string amplitudes from single valued correlation functions. So, <coughs> thank you very much for the invitation for this uh, meeting. It's, uh, uh, many people said it before, but I want to say it again. It's a very, very nice meeting. I've been learning a lot, and I am looking forward to an edition of that meeting as well to come back to Padova, which is a very nice city. So, I'm going to talk uh, about some work that I've done recently with uh, Federico, Federico Zerbini, the mathematician, some of you may know him already, about uh, the property of the low energy expansion of um, amplitude in string theory. And so one of the motivation of, of this work comes from the fact that uh, if you want to, to understand what is string theory, uh, there are many ways to try to approach that question. One is to compute amplitude, which is a perturbative statement. And when you get the amplitude, then you can take the low energy limit and see how string theory is modifying, for example, Einstein gravity, which these days is becoming very famous because of the um, uh, gravitational wave detection and black hole collisions. But you know, UV completion tells you that the, you need something else to just Einstein, the Einstein-Hilbert action. And string theory makes some very, very precise <coughs> prediction of what you should get. So you should get higher derivative operators. So here I just write the one in the gravity sector, but as well as the gauge theory sector, which are ordered by uh, increasing derivatives. Alpha prime is um, the length square of the string, so this is a dimension less quantity. And here you have a function of the moduli that have to satisfy some, some constraints. Okay? So in a perturbative computation, you can access part of this moduli, uh, the function of the moduli, but as well there are non perturbative aspe aspects of it. And one of the uh, lessons you get from string theory is that when you have some vacuum that you obtain by compactifying string theory to lower dimensions, these objects are very, very interesting function of their argument. They are, in some cases, modular forms. Or, in general, they are automorphic forms associated to the duality group. And in the case of maximally supersymmetric case, the duality group are the famous E series, ED series, so this function are invariant under the action of the discrete lattice in the duality group, and they are constrained by some differential equations. Oh, so wrong way. So the reason why it's so important to understand these guys is that, as as has been shown by a series of papers, I mean, with Michael Green, is that you know <coughs> this guy contains higher derivative operators. So that means some of the species of this function have to do with if in a field theory you compute the UV divergence of maximal supergravity in given dimension, and there is a perfect match of the counterterm for the UV divergence in the dimension where in up to free loop. I mean, the problem is that with string theory it's difficult to go beyond free, to go to higher loop. So the field theory people, Zwiebel and collaborator, have been producing a lot of results that, but the program says that the two are compatible. But and as well, if you want to do some uh, phenomenology of string theory, you need to, I mean, you need to know the potential for the various moduli, and so these functions are really needed to understand what string theory predicts in terms of modification of the low energy um, action. So one of the simplest case, which is uh, to show you what you can get as an example of correction that string theory predicts, is that if you look in 10 dimension type 2b string theory, you get that the re derivati higher derivative couplings in terms of powers of the Riemann tensor are just uh, objects that are uh, SL2 modular forms. So they are objects that transform under the action of SL2z by a phase. So they are modular forms of functions, anyway. So an omega is in the uh, SL parameterizes the vacuum. Yeah. And if you use constraints from supersymmetry and things like that, 
you found that the first term in this expansion k is satisfies a, a simple differential equation, which is the Laplace equation on SL2Z, which has a solution, a non-holomorphic Eisenstein series of that form. Okay? If you, and that means if you look at what this function is a non-perturbative quantity, I mean it contains perturbative and instantons, but the perturbative part, if you look at what it gives, it gives a three-level term for this higher derivative coupling that is zeta three, then a one-loop zeta two, then non-perturbative. The next coupling has a zeta five, no one-loop, a zeta four. Okay. You go to the next order in the expansion you can find that it satisfies the inhomogeneous differential equation in SL2Z. You can solve it, I mean, you can solve that equation, and you can extract what is the perturbative uh, term in these couplings. So we find that the, the three-level term has zeta three square. Then the one-loop term is zeta two times zeta three, and the two-loop term has a zeta four times one, zeta six times one. So now, if you look at these numbers, then you see zeta three, zeta, zeta 5, zeta 3 square. Here, if I divide by zeta 2, it's 1, 0, zeta 3. So here, I don't have enough data but to, to make an impression, but essentially, if you divide by zeta 4, which is the volume of the fundamental homogeneous 2, you get 1. So there is a natural normalization by the, zeta, the even zetas. And then you are left with some coefficient that should, that seem to be only odd zetas values up to the level that have been shown to you. So in fact, actually, if you, if you try to think more about what really is the content of this function in terms of perturbative computation, then you realize that for the four-point function, all the coefficients that you call three-level are just polynomial in the odd zeta values. By essentially unitarity, you can convince yourself that a genus one, once you have divided by the volume of the fundamental domain, the zeta, the, 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 the zeta two uh, factor, then the, f the piece that is left over is again something that is polynomial in the odd zeta values for the four-point function. And a, a genus two, essentially the same happens as well up to a normalization <coughs> normalizing factor. So it was clearly noticed by this very uh, uh, explicit computation that something special was happening because polynomial in odd zeta values is something, I mean, it's not a generic case of what can happen. So, the point of this talk is to, 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 to explain just a tree level, so genus zero case, why you just have this special value of, of zetas that are uh, uh, appearing, and then I will make a more precisely the statement of what you expect when the computation involves multiple zetas. So any closed string amplitude at tree level can be expanded as a a finite linear combinations of what I call building blocks. So, so a clustering amplitude at genus zero is essentially a sphere with n punctures. So you fix three, po three punctures to be zero, one, infinity. So there is a puncture at zero, a puncture at one, and a puncture at infinity. And you have to integrate over n. So if you have n plus three puncture, you fix three puncture, and then you integrate over n of them over the Riemann sphere. Okay, so this way. And then you get an integral here that has uh, uh, that involves the kinematic invariant. So this has this this is alpha prime, the small parameter I'm using for the expansion. This is complex number that has to the, the kinematical invariant. And then you see, so this is the holomorphic norm. I mean, this is a clustering, so there is modulus. But here you have terms that have no absolute values, but the powers are integers. Okay. So depending if you do a bosonic string, uh, type 2A or type 2B superstring, or heterotic string, you always have the same integral, but the only thing you have to choose to tune are the rational coefficients in terms of the um, kinematical variables. So if you want to understand the nature of this at a small alpha prime expansion, you have to understand the expansion of these integrals and the expansion of this coefficient to understand the properties of this object as an expansion, as a low energy expansion. So let me look at a simple case, the four-point case. The four-point case, you just uh, integrate over uh, one position over the, 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 the sphere. And here are my kinematical invariant. Here are this guy, n, n1, 2, n1 bar, n are uh, integers. They can be positive or negative integers. So suppose all these integers are just minus 1. Then you, this integral is of the type 
oh, I should have maybe used W. Anyway, so Z to the modulus 2 alpha minus 2, 1 minus Z to the, okay. So a lot of these people in the room can do this in their head. And you know that this is famously expressed in terms of this exponential uh, expression. So there is, there is a factor here that you need to have a pole when alpha and beta is 0. I mean, physically, this is the pole you expect for the massless propagators. But anyway. But then you see that the exponential only contains odd zeta values, OK? So this is, this is the reason why I only add zeta 3, zeta 5, and what I said, OK? But one way to compute that integral is to do what we call holomorphic factorization, or KLT relations, if you are a physicist. Then you split up the, the, this complex integral in product of two line integrals. So there are two integrals over the, real, uh, over the interval 0, 1. Then there's a factor that depends on alpha prime and some kinematical invariant. And then here you see you are just lifted the absolute value. And the guy with the w's go here, and the guy with the w bar go there. Okay? So then, then the question is that this integral is you evaluate that, you evaluate that. Okay? And each of these integrals are of the type of standard hypergeometric. Then if you integrate it, then you find again the pole, fine. But then in the exponential, there are all the zeta values. It's not just the, they are the, both the even and the odd one. So that means you have to multiply an object that contains all the zeta values from here, all zeta values from here, something that has an alpha prime expansion that will bring some pi's and pi's. So the even zeta values are powers of pi's. So there is a pi here, and it's important. So that the expansion matches something that has only odd zeta values from here, right? So that looks like magical if you think it this way because it's not totally clear uh, why uh, this has to work to all cases. So the fact that actually this clustering integral on the, on, on the sphere has only the uh, odd zeta values is a manifestation that actually uh, this closed string integral is a single valued projection of the single of this open string integral that has all zeta values. And the single valued projection is something that uh, Francis introduced that explains how to restrict the subset of the, 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 the multiple zeta values to in a, in a very meaningful way. So I'm going to explain what is this single uh, multiple zeta values. So first, I mean, I need to, to, to recap a bit about hyperlogarithm. I suppose a lot of these people in the room know, know a lot about that. So, but you have the alphabet, then you can recursively construct an object that is called the hyperlogarithm. You start with some object. In, so, the, so, so you have points, and then you have your words, and it can be noted like that. So one of the uh, trivial example is the powers of logs. I mean, this is logs. And then by you know, iterated integrals, then you generate object associated with a word that have some length. And this is, this is the iterative the, um, definition of what you call this hyperlogarithm. Okay? So these objects are defined on, um, on the sphere minus the position of this uh, distinct point. And they are multi-valued function. And in particular, if you take uh, x, well, the point to be, uh, the alphabet to be 0 and 1, this evaluates to the multiple polylog, right? So this is the ordered sum of z to the new, and this is a multi-valued function that everybody is familiar with. So one of the things that is actually that you know is that if you set z to be one, I'm sorry, uh, you are getting the, z the multiple zeta values. Now what you can do is that actually this object, this is the word and this is z, you can do an expansion in terms of the powers of logs locally, okay? So this is this is an expansion we will have to, we will use later in the um, in the talk. And uh, the thing that, that is very nice is actually this hyperlogarithm that satisfies the well known uh, Knizhnik Zamolchikov differential equation, you know, with the simple poles. And Francis Brown has this very uh, important theorem that says that there is a unique real analytic single valued solution to this of the KZ equation such that it has this growth when z equal, when you go to z equals 0. Okay? So then the point is that then you have a solution that is fixed by this, val by this uh, boundary condition. And then the point is that then you can ask what is the value of this function when z equals 1. So what happens is that when, when, when z, um, I'm sorry, 
So when z equal one, what's happening is that you realize that if you use this definition of the single valued version of that, the z equal one would give not the, 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 all the zetas that you had before, but a subset of them. So a consequence of relating at one of the single valued uh, multiple polylog that Francis introduced is that all the, the even zeta values gets to zero, the odd zeta values of depth one is just doubled. Some multiple zeta values get reduced to the product of two single valued odd zetas. And this big uh, depth free uh, uh, multiple zeta values is this linear combination. So, so in a sense, what you see is that you are reducing the space of, uh, of multiple zeta values by going to, by defining them as a value at one of a single valued function, uh, the way Francis defined it. And so essentially the, the statement that physicists then uh, noticed is that the closed string amplitude is a single valued projection of the open string amplitude, okay? So let me, as a string theorist and con uh, who likes conformal field theory, try to do the same. So the, the, the open string building block I introduced are numbers once you have fixed the kinematical variable. It's not a function of anything. I mean, if you fix the kinematical variables, then it's a number. So I want to build the function. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm going wrong way. So I, I want to build the function of z that essentially is my uh, 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 correlator where I introduce a fictitious uh, auxiliary uh, tachyonic type of vertex operator so that I'm getting the integral I discussed at the beginning of the talk, except that now there is a z dependent. There is z and z bar, OK? And I want this object to be such that when I evaluate it to 1, I'm getting the building block of my closed string amplitude. Now, the thing that is very, very important is that this object is uh, a correlator in conformal field theory, two-dimensional conformal field theory. So you know by, because it's a physical object, that it is a single valued function of z. So, so essentially what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to do at the level of the conformal correlator, build the equivalent of the single valued uh, multiple polylog, and then the value at one of the single valued multiple polylog that Francis constructed by giving the single valued projected uh, multiple zeta. So I want that this is then, again, obtained. So, and uh, so, th so this, is th this is what I want to say. So now I want to study the, the, this function here. So let me look at the four-point case. So for the four-point case, because I introduced this z, my, my integral over the, the complex plane has an extra z variable. So I can try to do no diolomorphic factorization. But because I have a z dependence, it's just not just a product of two integrals. I, I, I have to introduce two sets of integrals, I mean, with the z dependence. And I'm getting that this object is actually, this is a numerical matrix. And I have this, these two hypergeometric functions. The one with the bar is the same with the indices that is A bar, B bar, C bar, and Z bar, okay? So this is just the holomorphic factorization of that object. It's the same as the KLT relation of people who know it in, 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 in string theory, except that because of the Z, I mean, it's like a five-point function, so this is why you need two objects, okay? So in general, all this uh, conformal correlator, I can always expand it in uh, conformal blocks, so this, this product of integral of Z and Z bar, and, and a matrix here that only depends on the data of the kinematical invariant and the integers. And all these integrals are all line integrals, so they are just the generalization of, I'm sorry, <coughs> generalization of these ones, okay, to the generic case. So you integrate the z, and you have no, essentially, uh, 0, 1, and z, so you have to, to think about the, the cycle on which you order that and you want to, to, to take a basis of independent integral, and this is very trivial. And these integrals are very well known. They are the so-called amoto gelfon type of integral. And we know that this, okay, this, as a function of z, they satisfy the kijinik zamolchikov equation. Okay, they are the conformal blocks of the CFT. I mean, this is one way to prove it. I mean, oh, you can prove it mathematically. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and, but the thing that is important is they are multivalued. So here I have object that is multivalued, it's multivalued, this is single valued. So you'd, you'd better be a constellation of monodromies between these two guys to get a single valued object here. So this is what's, what's going to happen. 
So if you look at the monodromies of each of these functions, if you go through 0 and 1, there's a monodromy matrix you can define in a usual way. So what's going to happen is that because the, the spin, so that means the difference of the, uh, uh, yes, so the difference of the exponent here and here. So you see W and W bar as an exponent A, I, A bar, I. The difference is an integer. The difference needs to be an integer. Here, minus this one has to be an integer. This minus this needs to be an integer. So that, essentially, what's happening is that the monodromy matrix of this guy around 0 will be uh, the same as the monodromy matrix of this one. So they will, uh, the phase will co can compensate together. And, and, and if you don't have this condition that the, the relation between the, uh, the exponent is an integer, then you won't be able to make a single valued object here. So if you look at this basis of a motogel form type of hypergeometric function, then you realize that the basis I wrote is as a block diagonal monodromies when you go around zeros. So actually, this is block diagonal, this is block diagonal, and this is actually a diagonal matrix. No, what's happening is that if you look at the monodromies around one, uh, this i function that have, uh, don't have uh, block diagonal monodromies around one, so it's better to try to use to make the change variable 1 minus z. And then in this basis where you have done these change variables, then this object that are as well um, uh, a motogel from a hypergeometric function, they have block diagonal uh, monodromies. Okay? So, so what's happening now is that what you want to do is that you want to solve the condition that you kill the monodromy of this, of this uh, function around z equals 0 you kill the monodromies of the function around z equal 1. So that gives you two matrix, two, uh, that gives you uh, two matrices on the way the monodromy are combined. And the change between z equal 0 and z equal 1, which is a change of basis, is just a linear change of basis between the amoto gelfand um, integrals, which actually is exactly what you do when you compute the KLT relations between the integrals. So this is exactly the KLT construction to do that. Uh, although this is a function of z. So this is the usual, uh, uh, it's linear algebra between this uh, hypergeometric integral. So to have the compatibility between the absence of monodromy in 0 and 1, there's a matrix equation that you need to solve, which is written this way. And uh, then the, 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 the system is, uh, has a unique solution up to scale. So, in a sense, I mean, what I'm saying is that has already been not, uh, done in a way uh, by Dotsenko and Fateyev when they looked at the conformal correlator of the Coulomb gas. They used a differential equation approach. But, but in a sense, they were not interested about the string theory setup. So, uh, so, uh, so, but they, they could not prove the, I mean, they, there was no doubt that you could solve always the monodromy condition for the Coulomb gas because the CFT is simple enough. But the point is that uh, they, 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 they could do it in some cases. They could not do it in general. But OK. So anyway, so then what's happening is that you can solve. And then what you do is that you build this function, g of z, that has only that, uh, that is single valued. No, what you do is that you have to use the fact that the alpha prime expansion of these building blocks, that is the amoto gelfand uh, integrals are, are to be multiple polylogarith with coefficient polynomials in mzv and 2 pi i. Then you have to use that the, the, the matrix, the element of this matrix, g's, are exactly the equivalent of this uh, sine function that I had before. Why is the sine? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Well, anyway, I don't find it. So anyway, so you have to use that actually this, this matrices are composed of sine of 2 pi uh, signs of pi alpha prime from the kinematical variables. So then the, the coefficient of the matrices contains exactly the right powers of pi to kill the even zeta, the, all the pi's and the even uh, the non single value multiple zetas that you get from this expansion. And everything works like that. Okay? So if you do it at the level of the matching the string amplitude, then the z equal 1 value of this uh, amoto gelfand integral, there is a nice basis where one element of the uh, basis is exactly the open string color order amplitude, and the other element are 0. So then that means you find that the, you recover the KLT relations. 
But in general, I mean, you need more because when you build this single valued conformal correlator, you have a function of z. So essentially, the KLT relation, which is the momentum kernel or, or whatever the, you want to call it, is one block of that big matrix. And in order to have a control that you don't want a single valued object, you need to enlarge your space. So you get an extended <coughs> version of the, 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 the KLT matrix if you want. But then the extra entries drop out when you set z to 1. And if you apply to the four-point function, you get, uh, you get actually a version of the KLT relation that is with the modulus square and this rational prefactor. And then if you use the relation of the open string amplitude, this is the same, the standard relation that you have in KLT. So, so this is the way you get it, the single value uh, expansion. So the fact that this alpha prime expansion that on the four-point function has only zeta three, zeta five, zeta, zeta seven. And if you go to higher point, it's not only the depth one, it's higher depth, but it's still single valued from the sort of, uh, how much time? Okay. So, so the thing is that what I want you to, to realize is that this guy, these building blocks, okay, so is, you can use this uh, um, KLT relation to write it as a product of this, um, uh, so what I, what, I, what I explain is that how the expansion of the building blocks, which is the value at z equal one of this function, has only single valued multiple zetas. So, because there's a conspiracy between all of them. The physical string amplitude is, in general, a combination of these building blocks. So, if I want really to expand in alpha prime my physical amplitude, I have as well to control the, uh, you know, the kinematical coefficient. It's exactly what you do when you, so this decomposition is like when you do in quantum field theory, uh, uh, an expansion of your amplitude on the basis of mass time integrals, right? So, what's happening is that this coefficient uh, is actually uh, a rational function of the kinematical variable and product of polarizations and polarization and momenta. And so when, I mean, when you think about it, because it can be constructed uh, I mean, from first principle, you realize that you never introduce anything that spoils the, the fact that you have already only single value multiple zeta when you do the low energy expansion of that block. But one thing that you have to understand is that, for example, in, in a case of like, um, for example, the heterotic string, which is a supersymmetric theory, still because there's the non-supersymmetric sector, this object has a denominator. Because it has, due to the tachyonic pole that you, you, you have, you know, that you kill in the spectrum. So that means uh, this object has only single value zeta, but there is no uniform transcendentality. So I'm not proving that there is a relation between the weight and the alpha prime expansion because that's wrong. That's just plain wrong. I mean, it's only true in type two, but in heterotic string, that's not correct because you just have, this is true for this object, yeah? But this is not true for the physical amplitude because of exactly the, the pole that is there, I mean. So this is, this is an important uh, remark. So, uh, the, the, so there is no correlation. Uh, I mean, so, so there is no principle of maximal transcendentality. So let me now take another way to do the same thing, okay? So let's go back to uh, the four-point function. So I had computed already in two ways this, uh, this integral over the complex sphere, but let me do it in a different way. So do the expansion of the integrand using logs, okay? So this, you, I mean, um, uh, I don't want to discuss convergence issue, so assume everything is fine. So you do it this way, okay? So it's a trivially says expansion, you know, respect to, to, to the small parameter that is alpha and beta here, all right? And, and, and uh, it's important here that I'm keeping the new, <coughs> it's important that I'm keeping the modulus square one minus z modulus square. So this guy is the log of the modulus square and the log of one minus modulus square. But this is precisely what, what you call the single valued log, uh, I mean, uh, with, with, with associated to the word 0m and the word 1m, okay? So this is the, the single valued log that uh, Francis constructed. So essentially, if you want to then to expand the integrand, so first, uh, then you, you, well, the question is that, okay, you have this sum, it's single valued, yeah? 
Then you want to do the integration, like that, fine. But then uh, you want to see that this integral is still single-valued, right? <coughs> OK? It doesn't spoil the single value in S. And of course, then, then you can do it, because uh, you can use the, the fine by Oliver Schnetz about the way to integrate single-valued function by doing this. Uh, you find you have your function, you find a single-valued primitive, capital F. Um, and, and then, essentially, your computation is the residue computation. So you compute at infinity, and then at the puncture, <coughs> and everything is fine, and everything is single-valued. OK? No. Uh, uh, and, uh, OK, so if you then you, to do that, you have to combine this theorem by Oliver Schnetz and this theorem by Francis Pond. I hope Francis doesn't object, but in a sense, this is, this is the way you, you, can, you can do it. So now let's go, let's go back to the four-point function. So the four-point function, you have this. Then you can construct explicitly what is f, because it's so simple that you just read it. <laughs> f satisfies this, OK? And then you just use Schnell's theorem, and then bingo, you win. The four-point function, so this is this, uh, the most simplest case. It's a baby exercise. It's a wonderful application of all these uh, fantastic techniques. So now go to five-point. So to five-point, then you do this expansion here. And then the point is that, uh, so the five-point amplitude, then what you do is that you want to integrate one by one. So because at five points, you have fixed three points, zero, one, infinity. So you are still integrating over two vertex operators. So you want first to do the integration over one vertex operator, considering the, the five uh, vertex operator number four, fixing that vertex operator number five is fixed. You can do using Schnetz and, and Francis uh, theorem. But then the problem is that then it ends up that, so you get an expression after the first integration that is single value uh, log, I mean, uh, hyperlogs. But then the problem is that the position of your vertex operator gets into the world. And that is a technical complication. So in a sense, I mean, it, the iterative integration procedure gets uh, slightly messed up with the fact that you, the, your variable you, on which you want to integrate, then you want to integrate over z <laughs> to finish up. So then you have to use, uh, uh, well, OK, a theorem, yes. Let's call it like that. Uh, well, it's a theorem, yes. Uh, that allows you to bring z out of your world. So you can then re-expand your uh, hyperlog where z is in your world. In, in, a, in a basis of single-valued, I'm sorry, single-valued hyperlog where z is in the world to, sing, to single-valued hyperlog where z is in the argument. So, yes, so you want to exclude one point from your set of words. So this is the thing that is a bit annoying when you do it recursively. But once you have, I mean, there is no real complication. And it's a very, very, I mean, and on way of doing this single valued expansion at three level. If you really want to understand what's going on at each step, I mean, there is, I mean, except that step is, is pretty annoying. I mean, this is the way it works. So, so the statement now is the following. So you have, uh, so you have two objects. So you have open string amplitude and closed string amplitude. So the closed string amplitude are associated to um, integrals of that sort with modulus square. <coughs> Open string amplitude are associated with integrals of that sort, that is this Amotogelfon type of integrals. And by holomorphic factorization, you know that the closed string amplitude can be written as sum of product of the open string amplitude. So this is the conformal blocks. This one are multi-valued. So their expansion contains all multiple zeta values. And this one has only the single valued multiple zetas. So the, the, the theorem by, uh, actually, the, the, there is this nice paper by Broder, Schlotter, Stieberger, and Terrasoma that says that, actually, the closed string object can be expanded as a series in alpha prime. And the coefficients are just, uh, they, they belong to this uh, uh, special value, this single valued uh, version of multiple zetas. And uh, essentially, they were, I mean, based on a lot of explicit computation, uh, Stieberger and Stieberger and Oliver Schlotter, they indeed uh, conjecture that um, the, this integral is obtained as a single valued projection a la Francis Braun. Uh, and this is, this is the, the way it works. So now, the thing is that. Uh, 
last summer, there had been a series of papers, and in particular this very nice paper by Francis and Clément Dupont about proving, actually, that, uh, that these uh, integrals actually are, uh, actu they, they do expand on a single valued uh, multiple zeta, I mean, by using very, very sophisticated uh, mathematics. So I think, I would say our contribution to, 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 to this topic here yeah, is that um, to have essentially connected this uh, single value projection to first uh, physical requirement. So the fact that there are conformal correlators, it's natural that you get a single valued function which evaluates to the single valued expansion. <coughs> and second, this iterative algorithm, which I just scratch for five points, which where you can do the computation explicitly using both Schnetz and, 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 and Braun, with the com little complication that each time you need to get out of your, the world your variable of integration. But this is, this is the technical point. So what I like in this construction is that what I've done to genus 1, to genus 0, <coughs> should work to any genus. So any conformal correlator on any genus, uh, higher genus Riemann surfaces is single valued, right? So there are the modular forms that I didn't discuss. There are modular forms at genus 1 that are uh, single valued version of Eisenstein series and generalization of Eisenstein series. And actually, the reason why this is in this generalization to genus 1 is because there are closed string correlators at genus 1. But, but in a sense, I mean, if you think in terms of the alpha prime expansion to any string amplitude to any genus order, you should only see single valued object because of what I said, the CFT and the minimal, it's a Coulomb gas. I mean, it's a minimal model. So everything has to work. And it's still a challenge, both to physicists and mathematicians, to get it to work to, I mean, genus one, genus two, and uh, all genus. But I think the logic, I mean, is there. So, so thank you. Any questions for Pierre? Uh, thanks for the nice talk. This may be more comment than a uh, question. So you mentioned this theorem that you can swap the letters. Yes. I mean, this is something that was already done several years ago uh, for many more variables in the context of um, multi regi amplitudes and extra super angles. So, ah, that, uh, okay. precisely this operation of using Snes's residue theorem and then okay. doing integrations one by one. I think we went up to like M06 or something like that with that. Ah, precisely okay. using this algorithm and always swapping the integration variables around. Okay, uh, so, sorry, so, okay. Uh, um, sorry for. Uh, so, so you made an intriguing reference to work by Fadiev uh, on the Coulomb gas. I didn't know about this work. Um, this is this predates string theory. It's independent of string theory. No, no, no? It's, it's exactly so. I mean, I had the good uh, fortune to do my master thesis with uh, Dotsenko. And so I've been through that paper. So it's at the same time as KLT. So what they did is that they, they showed that the, uh, in the minimal model, so, so you have uh, Coulomb gas with screenings, and then they compute all four point correlators. So there is a series of two papers. They compute the four point correlator, I mean explicitly, and in terms of this hypergeometric function. They use differential equation techniques. And so and they show they can solve it totally. So. At some point, I mean, they do contour integral as well to do the holomorphic yeah. factorization. It's exactly the same as what you do in KLT, so, so this is the same. But, but the message you get from Dotsenko and Fadeyev, Fadeyev uh, is, um, is, uh, is that it works for any, in, even the supersymmetric version of it. So people have then extended their model. It, it's not just, I mean, so it applies <coughs> exactly on the nose to what you want in strength theory. And it's, it should apply to higher genus as well. Genus 1, you can see it works. Nobody has done it at higher genus, but I mean, there's no, no problem with that. I mean, you Thank you.
time for one more question. Well, if not, let's thank again the speaker.